Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 162, which reads as follows Yasa achanta dusiliyang malu asalam ito tatang. Salami votatang karoti so tatatanang yatanang chati di so. Yasa achanta du siliang. The person whose, whose evil behavior knows no bound or has crossed a line. Maluva salomito tatang, like a like a, a vine that covers over a great sal tree. Sala, sala tree being is very tall trees. Karoti so tathatanang. Such a person does to themselves yatanang ichati diso. Just as a enemy would wish for them. So this verse was taught in relation to Devadatta. The text we have is quite short. Uh, the text, uh, the commentary around this verse is simply that the monks were sitting around in Weluana, the bamboo grove. talking about how evil, evil Devadatta was. Devadatta was the Buddha's cousin. He is the epitome of a bad monk. It's about as bad as it gets. He, he did a lot of bad things. And so basically they're talking about this and can't believe how far he's gone. You know? And the Buddha came, came and asked them, hey, what are you, what are you all talking about? And they told him, and the Buddha said, Oh, this isn't the first time Devadatta has done great thing, great evil you know, in the past as well. He did many evil things, and he told many Jataka, he told some Jataka stories. There's a lot of Jataka stories surrounding Devadatta. A lot of the Jataka stories are about the Buddha's greatness, and often he needs the foil of Devadatta to show how great he is in the face of great evil, how he reacts as a contrast. And so there's, a, there's 20, 30, 40, there's many, many jatakas. Well, there's at least 20 or 30 jatakas with Devadatta in them, probably more. But what is it that Devadatta did? Uh, and so the, it mentions a few things in this story. Uh, so if you go, we, if we're not going to go back, I won't go through a whole list of all the things, but just briefly to go over it. In his past lives, he did many uh, evil deeds. He was constantly harassing the Buddha, trying to kill him, killing him, um, and other people as well. Devadatta was the evil one. In the uh, Jataka that I told about these two deers, the two deer, the two heads of the, the tribes of deer, Devadatta was the one that told this, this deer that she had to go, this pregnant deer that she had to go to, to uh, sacrifice herself. And the Buddha, on the other hand, took her place. And she went to the Buddha. The Buddha said, oh, you're pregnant. He said, go back and give birth freely, don't worry. Your 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 uh, uh, your turn has been passed, and then he went himself. Uh, there's the story of. He's fairly prominent in the story of uh, Mahosada, which is the longest of the Jatakas. It's this long story about how this young boy becomes. Uh, anyway. 
he ends up dealing, ends up becoming a, a advisor to the king, and I think his other king comes, and the other king's advisor is Devadatta in the past. But talking about this life, I mean, it's important we know if you're interested in Buddhist, the background of Buddhist culture and religion, it's important to know about Devadatta. So, uh, when it started off, he became a monk, along with the Buddha's other cousins and relatives. And the other monk, the other relatives of the Buddha all became at least a Sotapanna, generally Sotapanna, and then they were working to get to the higher stages. Devadatta didn't get anything. He, what he gained from his practice were the jhanas and magical powers. So he was able to calm his mind like the other monks, but he wasn't able to go further. There was too much evil in his heart, and too much, it was too rotten from all the many lifetimes of evil, no matter how hard he tried. And so he, uh, he gained magical powers through his practice, and he was able to apparently change his, his uh, appearance and so on, and fly through the air. Lots of neat stuff that he got caught up in and intoxicated by and thought somehow he was special because of it. Uh, and then at some point it all came to a head. He, he was acting as an ordinary monk and you know, practicing meditation, but at some point it got too much for him. I think as the Buddha's own fame and, and glory was spread far and wide, everyone was talking about how great the Buddha was, how great Sariputta was, how great Moggallana was, and there wasn't a lot of greatness about uh, spread about Devadatta because he wasn't all that great and he was, uh, he was jealous of the praise bestowed upon the other monks. And so he thought to himself, well, I'll, I'll, I'll achieve greatness. And he went to Ajata Sattu, uh, the, the prince, the son of Bimbisara. Bimbisara was a follower of the Buddha. And Bimbisara would have nothing to do with Devadatta, but Ajata Sattu didn't, was a young boy and didn't know anything. And in fact, Ajata Sattu had bad karma as well. He was destined to kill his father. He had a, a bad upanisaya. His past was riddled with bad as well. And so they, they got in, got along quite well together. Devadatta impressed him with his magical powers, and Ajata Sattu was, uh, supported Devadatta by sending him uh, very opulent and, and uh, extravagant meals. And as a result of these meals and this support, Devadatta was able to become you know, big and famous. And they made a pact that Ajata Sattu, Devadatta said to Ajata Sattu, you, you kill your father and become king. You know, if you kill your father, you'll become king, and I'll find some way to kill the Buddha. Uh, or you help me kill the Buddha, and then I'll become the head of the, the, of the Buddha's religion. I'll be the head of the, the Buddhists. You know. And together we will rule India. You know. We will rule the world. And the Jetta said through this a long story about how he, he'd killed his father. He, he, he had him, in, him imprisoned and uh, eventually killed, but at the last minute, he he uh, he became remorseful and he ran to the to the prison where his father was being tortured, only to find that he was just a moment too late. His father had just died. So as a result, Ajata Sattu was was effectively a, uh, a patricide. He killed his father, which is. One of the great weighty karmas, you can't recover, you can't become enlightened if you've killed your father or your mother. It's one of those things that leads immediately or directly to hell, unfortunately. There's no way to mitigate it. It's one of those few acts in Buddhist dogma, doctrine. Uh, Devadatta went about trying to kill the Buddha in various ways, and he succeeded in hurting the Buddha. He dropped, uh, when the Buddha was walking down the mountain, he dropped a, 
a large rock on him and the rock somehow because you can't kill a Buddha it's not possible the rock went the wrong way and hit another rock and a little splinter flew off and hit the Buddha's foot and they say it caused the blood to rise it may not have broken his skin because that might be impossible but it bruised him perhaps and the Buddha was had a hard time walking and he lay down and they brought a stretcher for him and that's another one of the six weighty karmas once you've uh, tried to try once you've injured the Buddha you can never become enlightened no, not in this lifetime so Devadatta was doomed at that point along with the There was another time, sorry, I missed, missed one part of the story, is where Devadatta went to the Buddha and said, Oh, you're getting old. You should hand the, the Buddhist religion over to me. And the Buddha said, I wouldn't hand my religion over to Sariputta or Moggallana, who are great beings. Um, why would I give it to you as though I were uh, throwing away, as though I were vomiting up spittle? Uh, to give it, meaning to give it away to you would be you know this term lick spittle it would be it would be like uh, treating my religion like like excrement to give it to you that's all you're worth basically is what he's saying and he got very angry so that's when devadatta decided to go to kill to try and kill the buddha didn't work um, and finally because he tried to kill the Buddha. Ajatasattu eventually realized that, hey, this, you know, this Devadatta guy is not really um, worth following in the end. It's not really any benefit from following his teachings. Probably, uh, probably not the person to follow. At that point, Ajatasattu started to listen to the Buddha's teachings and became converted to the Buddha's teachings, but was never able to become a Sotapanna because of killing his father. Buddha said if he hadn't killed his father, he would have easily become a Sotapanna. Uh, so Devadatta tried then to create a schism in the Sangha. He succeeded in creating a schism in the Sangha. He went to the Buddha, and it's a famous and interesting story. How he went to the Buddha and uh, demanded that the Buddha uh, institute five rules, that monks should always live in the forest, uh, that they should live only on alms, meaning never go for a meal or accept an invitation. They should wear only rag robes and never never wear robes that were given to them. Uh, they should dwell only in the foot of a tree and never under a roof. And they should abstain completely from meat. The Buddha's reply was that, you could practice these if you wish, but he wasn't going to institute it as a requirement because at different times and in different situations. This is an interesting point because on the face of them they seem like good practices and they are good practices, even the one not eating meat, you know, if you don't want to eat meat. Although he said in, re in regards to that one, um, he's already made a point that uh, you, you should not eat meat if it's been killed for you if you know or think or even suspect that it's been killed for you you shouldn't eat it but regarding just eating dead flesh the Buddha was clearly not against it and I know there's some controversy among Buddhists over this one but yeah, I don't want to get into it at any rate it's interesting that the Buddha was quite clear that this was going too far to force monks to do these things and there's good reason Uh, but Devadatta be got a chance at this point because, because of this he was able to convince new and, and uh, in unexperienced, inexperienced monks uh, that the Buddha was soft. You know, the Buddha wasn't willing to institute real ascetic practices. And so uh, he managed to convince a whole large group of monks to go with him and he set himself up to teach and he, 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 he 
he started to teach whatever he thought was the Buddhist teaching or whatever he thought was the right teaching. And the Buddha sent Sariputta and Moggallana to win him, to win back his followers because these monks just didn't know any better. They weren't really evil. And so Sariputta and Moggallana went to see Devadatta and Devadatta was there preaching whatever he was preaching. And when he saw them come, he thought, ah, Moggallana and Sariputta have, have come over to my side. And he said, come, come, you're welcome. And he said, he said to them, he said, Sariputta Moggallana, you teach in my steed. I will lie down and, uh, and listen mindfully. Because that's what the Buddha would do. The Buddha would have someone else teach and he would lie down because he had been teaching long throughout the night. And when it became time to lie down, he would lie down and, and listen mindfully. Devadatta, when he lay down, he fell right asleep and started snoring, I guess. And uh, Sariputta and Moggallana at that point had an opportunity and they taught the monks the right path and convinced them all to go back to the Buddha. When Devadatta woke up, all, the monk, all of his followers were gone, except for a couple of his cronies, his henchmen. And one of them promptly kicked Devadatta in the chest, or he kicked him awake, I think. Kicked him in the chest to wake him up and said, Hey, wake up. I told you not to trust uh, Sariputta and Moggallana, and now they've taken all your followers back. And being kicked in the chest apparently was quite damaging to Devadatta, and he got quite sick at that point. Uh, he got sick and he had to lie down, he was vomiting blood, and suddenly he realized, with this bad health, he suddenly realized he was dying, and it shook him up and he wanted to go back and see the Buddha. And so he sent message ahead that he was coming to see the Buddha and his followers picked him up on a stretcher and carried him. And the Buddha heard that he was coming and said, Devadatta won't be able to make it to see me, not in this life, not after what he's done. And Devadatta, they carried him closer and closer and the monks told the Buddha, Oh, he's come, he's, he's, he's outside of the monastery, he's on his way here, he's a mile away, that kind of thing. And the Buddha said, let them bring him right up to the gate of, J of Jetavanda. There's no way that Devadatta will be able to see me, not in this life, not after what he's done. And so the monks brought Devadatta right up to the monastery, to the pool outside, and they set him down and they went to refresh themselves in the pool because it was hot and hard carrying it. And when they set him down, Devadatta looked and he saw that the gate was right there and he, 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 he thought he was strong enough to walk the rest away and he stood up. And as soon as he stood on the ground, the earth sunk beneath his feet and he was swallowed up whole and died and went to hell. Apparently this is a thing for great evil. You're actually swallowed up by the earth and die. The flames, the earth, the earth opens up and flames, the flames of hell shoot up and you're burnt to a crisp. So that's in very brief the story of Devadatta. If you want a longer version, a, fair, a bit of a longer version, you can read uh, in the Dictionary of Pali Proper Names. So that's what they were talking about. And the Buddha told this verse, he said, for someone who's gone across the line, and it's an interesting uh, expression, a chanta du si liang, one who's evil, who's du sila, who's bad practice, has gone to the extreme, or, or perhaps beyond the extreme, across the line. Anta is, uh, anta is the end. So uh, it either means it's gone over the, the border of what is still healable, still fixable, or, uh, or it means it's gone to the extreme. It can't get any worse than that, basically. So a couple of lessons here. That's the first one, is that there's a difference between evil and ajanta evil, evil that has gone to the extreme or has crossed a line. And that's important because it's easy to become self-loathing. You know, 
guilt, consumed by guilt over our evil. Uh, when we hear about the danger of evil, and we hear how how strongly it is denounced in Buddhism. I mean, I mean that's the focus. The focus in Buddhism is on ethics. There's no focus on God or heaven or rebirth or any of that. Uh, the focus is on good and evil. It's on ethic, ethical and unethical states, happiness and suffering as, as a product of goodness and evil. And so it's easy to become uh, greatly per disturbed by the fact that we still have evil inside, and there's good, there's merit to that. I mean, the fact that we are disturbed is not a bad thing. The last thing we would want is to become complacent in our evil, but it's important to be clear the path out of evil um, as being the comprehension and the understanding rather than the rejection. If you just reject something outright, it becomes based on aversion. So the way out of evil is to understand it and to see it clearly. It seems somewhat counterintuitive. You somehow let the things arise, let the anger arise, let the greed arise. But the alternative is only to get consumed by, by, by guilt and, and self-hatred and so on, which is, which is even worse because it's, it's putting something on top of it. It's not solving the underlying problem, it's just making it more complicated. And so it's important to have some reassurance that evil is not something that can't be, um, can't be dealt with. And be clear that there's a difference between evil and, uh, and being consumed by evil. So the, the key is to not be consumed by it. In fact, we should try at every moment not to be consumed by it. Where wanting something leads to chasing after it, or disliking something mean, leads to trying to get rid of it. So when you dislike something, it's the disliking that you should focus on. When you want something or like something, it's the wanting and the liking that should be focused on to be understood. And through understanding it, through seeing it objectively, you see that it's a cause of stress and suffering. It's not beneficial in any way. If you let it overcome you, it slowly, slowly begins to, you know, leads you on. And this is this great danger of being consumed by it. It gets worse and worse and worse until you're blinded by it, you're, you're consumed completely by it, like Devadatta. The really interesting thing about Devadatta is in the end, being consumed by evil is such suffering, it's such a terrifying state, that in the end you can't help, or Devadatta at least couldn't help but uh, realize the error of his ways. And in the very last moment he made a wish, um, to take, for, to take refuge in the Buddha. He, he, he held his hands up and took refuge in the Buddha right before he died. They say as a result, once he's done burning to a crisp in hell, which is where he is right now, they say, he will be reborn as a Pacheka Buddha. He will, he will be reborn as a human and become a Pacheka Buddha eventually, a private Buddha, because his mind changed. So even with great evil, um, the key really is is not to be not evil, it's to be mindful of your evil. Now that's where the change comes about, because you see, then you, you realize how much suffering comes from who you are, from this evil. Um, because the problem is that evil is, is, a, is a habitual. You can't suddenly turn off your habit. Suppose you're an evil person, evil in this way, evil in that way. In fact, we're all, we all have evil inside. Um, but, so we all have evil. But um, you know, if you say, I don't like this, I don't want this, how can I get rid of it? This is the problem, a problem that meditators have is this attempt to try and turn off our habits. And that's not how it works. It's a frustration because a meditator will hear all these things about how meditation helps you overcome bad habits and practice and practice and say, look, my habits are not turning off, they're not gone, I'm still... I had one meditator recently who's, I don't know if they're listening, but very, very stubborn. 
I think they know who they are. And and just recently they've they've started to taste the result. You know, it just takes a little patience and sort of a a a, 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 a um, perspective. You need to put it in put things in perspective. That uh, habits are strong and 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 have momentum, and it takes time for that momentum to to fade away and it's, it's not something you can stop by putting your fist in front, your hand in front of it to stop it. It's something that you slowly, slowly and in fact the more patient and the more um, delicate you are with it you find the more quickly they are they change. The more you try to control and force the harder and the longer it's going to take. Because you have to realize that that is a bad habit as well, trying to force and control things. So that's our first lesson, is in, in the degrees of evil and understanding there's a difference between evil and being consumed by evil. The second one is how, and it, I mean it's part and parcel, is that evil hurts the evildoer. There's a very Buddhist theory. In an ordin the ordinary perception of evil is that it hurts other people, right? You kill someone, well, they're the one who's suffered. It's in fact not really the case. It's interesting to think about, you know, people who are murdered, abused, tortured. Uh, in many cases, they do suffer terribly. Um, of course, in Buddhism, we would say it's not actually because of the thing that was done to them that they suffer. It's because most of us aren't equipped to deal with the situations. And that might sound somewhat harsh, but... Um, it's unfortunately the case. I mean, evil is 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 terrible to the victim uh, simply because we're vulnerable. But uh, evil itself doesn't harm the victim. You know, if you kill someone, or you, let's say you torture someone, which is even worse, right? You lock someone in the basement and torture them. Uh, I mean, theoretically, an enlightened person. Not even theoretically, an enlightened person can be completely at peace with all of that. The Buddha, the Bodhisattva, there's lots of examples, even before he was a Buddha, where he was tortured and sliced to pieces, had his nose cut off, had his hands cut off, had his feet cut off, had his head cut off, and uh, was completely at peace with it, even before he was enlightened. Maybe not completely at peace, but was quite patient with the suffering. So, what we would argue, what, what we, how we explain it, is that it's actually the evil in us as victims that causes us to suffer. And so by this we mean when someone is torturing you, you react to it with what? With anger, or with what we call, with batinga, with aversion. We call it, I use anger. When I say anger in, in a Buddhist sense, it usually just means aversion. It's this category. It's not actually anger is one type, but it's any state based on aversion. The patika is the jetasika. Um, and so that aversion is evil. I mean, it's aversion that leads you to kill. It's aversion that leads you to torture. Aversion isn't even the right one, but it's a. It's a wishing for harm, right? So wishing um, bad, it's a, it's a disliking state. When you, you don't hurt people you like, right? You hurt them when you don't, don't like, when you're angry, when you wish them harm, right? It's all, it's a negative state. Uh, and so the same states are, exist in the victim when they get upset at the person torturing them, when they get upset at the experience of being tortured. Reasonable. I mean, most of us aren't nearly equipped to deal with such experiences, and so we call them traumatic experiences. The thing is, the experiences themselves aren't traumatic. Um, the trauma lies in, in reacting violently to our experiences. But focusing on the evildoer, 
you know, the evildoer, who they're really hurting, the, wor the worst, is themselves, because the aversion and the, the depth of the evil in their minds, in their hearts, when they do these things, is destroying their minds. It's making it impossible, harder and harder for them to find peace and happiness. I always come back to this classic Russian novel, Crime and Punishment. It's a really good book in that for that purpose. If you read it, it's um, it's about a person who kills two people, and it, it is totally unprepared for what it's done to him, the nightmares he has, the, how the nightmare his life becomes, simply because you know, he thought he would be above, he could be above the law if he thought of himself as a great person. And he didn't realize it had nothing to do with the law. You kill and it makes you a psychopath. It, 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 it changes, it makes you psychotic, in a sense. You know? Of course, in the end, he was able, and, and you, killing is not, uh, doesn't, even killing a human being doesn't necessarily prevent you from becoming enlightened, as long as it's not one of your parents, or the Buddha, or a, an enlightened being, that, that kind of thing. But quite clearly, you know, if you or if you hate someone so much that you kill them, and the Buddha says, you've done. You know, you suppose two people hate each other. When you when you uh, commit evil, you do what they would wish for you. you know, they want you to suffer. Well, someone who would want you to suffer gets what they want when you do evil. You don't you don't make your situation better, you make your situation worse. I mean, that's key in meditation. That's key what we're see, what we're trying to see. I mean, this is this is conceptual in terms of people, right? We're talking in terms of people and their enemies, but the the essence of it is that evil harms the evil doer, and that's really what we're trying to see in meditation. We're not trying to believe this or have faith in it. We're trying to experience it. That at every moment of aversion, every moment of desire, every moment of ignorance, delusion, arrogance, conceit, we're, we're hurting ourselves. That these are the cause of suffering. These are the, 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 in the realm of, of what is causing us stress and suffering. That's what we're aiming to understand I mean to see evil for what it is not not believe in advance but to observe our mind so clearly to observe, observe our experience so clearly that we're able to see good and evil for ourselves without any belief or or doubt so that's the Dhammapada verse for tonight thank you all for tuning in have a good night.